Okay. Uh, hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to another one of our surgical fix sessions. I'm Noura Nasrallah, and I'm a surgical assistant at an Amiri Hospital. I'm going to be hosting today's session. Uh, today, we're actually having our last session of the Surgical Fix series, Volume 2. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed the series, and uh, we look forward to hopefully um, having you join us in another volume of our Surgical Fix, inshallah, in the future. Um, we're wrapping up our surgical series, um, a surgical fix series with an interesting topic that we encounter every day. So our topic today is going to be about uh, biliary stones. And our speaker today is Dr. Noreen Bdushi from Amman. Dr. Noreen is a uh, hepatobiliary surgeon and uh, she completed her residency in Amman. And then she uh, completed a fellowship in minimally invasive hepatobiliary onco surgical oncology from the University of McGill, and then another fellowship in hepatobiliary and transplant surgery from the University of British Columbia. She is also the a founding member of the Liver Transplant Committee in Oman. Uh, Dr. Noreen, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us and giving the last session of our series. Um, before we start, I would just like to say that uh, if you guys have any questions, please uh, put them in the Q&A session. Uh, also, if you would like to um, sign up for any of our future sessions, please refer to the, ch to the chat feature. Uh, so Dr. Nuri, the floor is yours. You can go ahead and start. Sure. So let's share the screen. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Noreen al -Badushi. I'm an HPB and liver transplant surgeon. Uh, I work in Royal Hospital in Oman, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here today and I would like to thank the, um, the Kuwaiti Association of Surgeons uh, for letting me, giving you this interesting topic. I know it's your favorite fruitful uh, topic and uh, hopefully you would understand uh, a bit about uh, managing, how to manage uh, a complex biliary uh, stones. So to start with my presentations, these are the objectives that I was given. Uh, first, we'll define and classify biliary stones into primary versus secondary and describe the uh, etiology. Then we'll outline the clinical presentation, the uh, different investigations we use to diagnose biliary stones. And then uh, we'll talk about the um, management of uh, uh, different biliary stones. So to start with, uh, I would like first to start with the anatomy. Um, so the biliary tree is divided into an intrahepatic and an extrahepatic biliary system. And for the intrahepatic biliary system, uh, we have the left hepatic duct, which drains the left lobe of the liver. And we have the right hepatic duct, uh, which drains the right anterior uh, sector and the right posterior sector. And then they join to form the common hepatic duct. And usually the common hepatic duct is four millimeter in diameter. And, uh, and then it joins the uh, cystic duct to form the common bile duct. And usually the diameter of the common bile duct is four to six uh, millimeter. And it can increase in the people who had uh, polycystectomy before, or the people reaching uh, 70 years of age, then it will kind of increase by one millimeter per year. Then the uh, common bile duct will uh, run into the free margin of the uh, lesser omentum to enter into the uh, duodenum posteriorly, where it joins the pancreatic duct and they open together to form the ampulla of batter, uh, which drains into the second part of the duodenum. So this is just a simplified uh, description of the anatomy that you need to know. So um, basically, uh, as per definition, uh, it's very easy. It's just stones within the biliary uh, tree. There is no consensus definition for biliary stones, and there is no consensus classification of biliary stones. There is primary and secondary common bile duct stones, but there's no consensus classification of biliary stones in general. But I found it very easy to, uh, to, 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 um, to classify it into um, either 
the uh, according to the stone type or stone location or stone synthesis. So stone type, it might be either a cholesterol stone or a pigment stone. And uh, according to the stone location, we are either talking about cholecystolithiasis, cholidocholithiasis, or, hepatic, or hepatolithiasis. And in terms of synthesis, they are either a primary uh, common bile duct stones or secondary common bile duct stones. And we'll go through all of them. So in terms of stone type, so we have a cholesterol stone and we have the pigment stone. And the pigment stone is further divided into the brown pigment stone and the black pigment stone. And each one is different in terms of etiology. And, uh, uh, but the presentation would be kind of similar, but the presentation in different uh, people it would be. So in terms of origin, um, so the cholesterol stones are more likely from the uh, gallbladder and it's more um, uh, abundant in the people, you kind of remember those F and people who are female, fair, fatty, fertile, and that's why the predisposing factor would be obesity, increased cholesterol synthesis, decreased bile uh, acid pool, and increased progesterone. And basically, 40 to 70 percent of cholesterol stone they are composed of cholesterol, and the other percentage goes with the uh, calcium bilirubinate and the bilirubin. And in terms of shape, they are either multiple or single, very large stones and round, and uh, they are hard and laminated. When it comes to uh, brown pigment uh, uh, stones, um, these stones uh, most likely uh, are the ductal stones. You'll find them as brown pigment stones. And uh, they, they are composed of 15% cholesterol, 60% calcium bilirubinate, and the other goes with uh, calcium uh, phosphate. And in terms of the predisposing factor, it's believed to be um, uh, the dietary effect can uh, affect the low protein, high carbs, uh, in cholangitis, stricture, biliary infections, uh, worms, uh, bacterial uh, parasitic infections, and uh, with biliary stasis as well. And when it comes to black pigment stones, uh, these uh, stones are uh, more likely related to cirrhosis, chronic hemolysis, like the people with sickle cell disease and G6PD and, uh, and uh, heart valve replacement people. And in terms of shape, they are multiple irregular uh, and usually they are small, small stones and very friable. In terms of uh, primary or secondary stones, so primary and secondary, usually we call it for the common bile duct stones. And we call primary common bile duct stones when they originate de novo within the bile ducts. And usually they originate within the bile ducts due to strictures, infections, stasis, chronic biliary obstruction due to malignancies or due to chronic strictures or post transplants. And they are usually brown pigment stones. And when it comes to secondary, secondary, they originate in the gallbladder, then they migrate into the common bile duct. And, uh, and these stones, it might be either uh, cholesterol or black uh, pigment stones, the original uh, stones which forms most likely in the gallbladder. And always remember that 10 to 15% of the patients who are undergoing polycystectomy for gallbladder stones, they will have a concurrent uh, ductal stones. So you should be aware of that. So when it comes in terms of location, then we do have the uh, gallstones, we do have the common bile duct stones, and we do have uh, the uh, common hepatic and the intrahepatic stones, which we call them hepatolithiasis. And we'll talk separately about each one of them. So um, when it comes to gallstones, we know that gallbladder disease is a common disorder worldwide, and the prevalence is in Western countries is 7.9% in males and 16% in females. And in uh, an Asian Pacific region, it ranges from 3 to 15%. Uh, and approximately 750,000 of polycystectomies are being performed every year in USA. When, in, when it comes to etiology, um, then uh, there are different theories about it. I'm just, um, I'm just, I'm just going to tell you about the theories that you need to know. It's a cholesterol supersaturation that there is an excess cholesterol, then the bile can dissolve, and that's why it will 
it will crystallize and form sludge and eventually in long term it will form stones and um, or the other etiology there is an excess uh, bilirubin um, from the breakdown of the uh, hemoglobin which is likely to happen in the hematological disorders and this leads to the uh, black pigment stones or there is a gallbladder hypomotility or hypocontractility. It's like the case what happens with the uh, uh, people who are uh, chronically malnourished or admitted to ICU or the elderly by definition because of their physiology. And I'm gonna show you the uh, physiology of the uh, age-related changes in the biliary tract. There will be always alteration in the bile uh, uh, constitutes. There will be uh, gallbladder hypomotility and there will be morphologic changes in the biliary system. So always these elderly people, they present differently. And whenever they present uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, either CBD stones or, or Baldock stones, they will be very sick. So you should always uh, try to, um, uh, to uh, over investigate such patients because they usually present uh, in atypical fashion. So basically the alterations in bile consisted uh, in uh, constant will lead to reduction in the bile synthesis and increase in conjugation of bile pigments. And when there is decrease in hypomotility, this will lead to decreased responsiveness of the gallbladder to cholecystokinin, and eventually this will uh, uh, form, they will keep the bile very concentrated and will form the stones. And there will be an increased size of the uh, common bile duct eventually because of the changes in the biliary system. So the potential complications of the uh, gallstones. So uh, the gallstones, they are e either uh, obstructing the cystic duct, which will cause the biliary, typical biliary colic pain, uh, which is the epigastric pain, which uh, radiates to the back and to the shoulder, or they can, the stones can get uh, uh, impacted there again. And on long term, they can cause an inflammation, which is called acute cholecystitis, or these stones, they can compress and fistulize through, um, uh, through the uh, uh, bile duct, uh, which we call it Amerizi syndrome, or the stones are impacted at the ampulla of water and then they can cause cholangitis or pancreatitis, or they can uh, fistulate into the duodenum because of the long chronic inflammation of the uh, gallbladder, uh, which will cause a gallstone ileus that the stones are obstructing the bowel or they can obstruct the stomach and cause Bovary syndrome, gastric outlet obstruction. The other thing they can cause a long-standing, long-standing polyethiasis can result in gallbladder carcinoma because anything which can cause uh, chronic inflammation of the gallbladder and the biliary system, it just predisposed to the uh, cancer formation. And the other thing, the impaction of the uh, stones in Hartman pouch, it will result in distension of the gallbladder, there will be over distension, and that uh, that is called a mucosal of the gallbladder. All of these conditions, they were uh, described previously by Dr. Muhammad Jamal, and you can subscribe to, to Surge Q8 and watch his presentations. I'm not gonna go into all these uh, uh, differential diagnoses because it was uh, discussed previously, but let's concentrate here about the primary and secondary CBD stones and the hepatolithiasis. So cholidocolithiasis, it's defined as stones in common bile duct and 10 to 18% of the cholecystectomies, they will have a concomitant CBD stones. And the incidence will increase with age and 30 to 50% on those over 70 years of age undergoing cholecystectomy, they will have uh, uh, CBD stones. And the cumulative frequency of recurrence, even after endoscopic management, which was found in literature, it's 12%. So it's a challenging, uh, um, it's challenging to have CBD stones. And it's been always a challenge for the uh, gastroenterologist and the interventional radiologist, as well as the uh, surgeons. In terms of clinical presentation, the patient might present, might be asymptomatic or might present with jaundice and ascending cholangitis or liver pyogenic abscesses. And um, the most important thing that we need to know is charcoal triad, which is fever, jaundice, and right upper quadrant pain, which signify that that patient will have uh, uh, cholangitis. These are the important features that we need to look for because the most important thing when you diagnose a patient with CBD stones is to manage cholangitis phase first and then deal with the stones. 
uh, or the patient might present with Reynolds pentad, which is charcot tried plus hypotension and altered mental uh, uh, status. So the patient will require an ICU admission and will require a, a more intensive care. When it comes to workup, so blood investigations, it will show most likely when there is CBD stone, a cholestatic picture. And we know the cholestatic enzymes are bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, and the gamma -glut uh, glutamate transferase. So these are the things that we look into it. And sometimes there will be mild elevation of the ALT and AST because of the uh, uh, reflex uh, cholangitis. The uh, radiological investigations of choice in terms of CBD stone, uh, first, we always start with the ultrasound. It's our uh, most uh, common initial investigation that will give us a lot of, uh, uh, that will give us um, basically a picture of whatever is happening. And, uh, and then we can move further into the, uh, uh, into the uh, bigger investigations and then the more invasive investigations. So, um, so transabdominal ultrasound can tell you a lot about the biliary tree, how much is dilated. If the stones are evident and kind of big and there is no gas shadows there, then you will find the stones easily. Uh, if there are um, abscesses within the biliary system, then it can uh, basically uh, detect it. And it's inexpensive, readily available, so we can use it. And uh, then there is uh, um, MRCP. We can use an MRCP to delineate the biliary tree and know more that there is an enhancement because of cholangitis, detect the stones, the, the, the number of stones, how big are the stones. Then more detailed uh, biliary anatomy, we can always get it from MRCP. And ERCP, um, it's the endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, and uh, it's uh, used uh, to diagnose, and we can use it uh, as a therapeutic option as well to relieve the patients from those stones. But always remember that they carry the chance of 2, 2 to 9% of acute pancreatitis, so uh, keep it at the lower at the lower and bottom of the uh, list, unless the patient is very sick and septic and needs decompression. Endoscopic ultrasound is a very good modality and a very good tool in detecting the biliary microcalculi. So if you saw that there is, uh, um, there is, there is widening of the CBD, but you don't see any stones and you cannot figure out the diagnosis, then endoscopic uh, uh, ultrasound can always detect if there is microcrystals and microcalculi in the distal uh, CBD. So this is an, an ERCP image. You can see here that there's a filling defect within uh, the, um, the uh, common bile duct, uh, which, detect, uh, uh, which shows that uh, it shows the stones clearly. And here you can see in the uh, MRCP, the stones in the, in, the, in the bile duct. So when it comes to sensitivity and specificity of each uh, uh, investigation, when it comes to ultrasound, the sensitivity is always 20 to 55% for detecting CBD stones. And for EUS, uh, it achieves almost uh, 95 and 97% and the sensitivity and specificity for the uh, MRCP, it's 93 and 96 uh, percent. So you can see that the MRCP and EUS, they are quite similar and they are quite sensitive. But the MRCP can give us more clear picture, especially if we're looking into other stuff like uh, pyogenic liver abscesses or stones within the common hepatic duct and the intrahepatic biliary system. CT has a sensitivity for common bile duct stones, which is only 66.7%. But um, a lot of surgeons, they like to do CTs in the beginning just to delineate if the patient does have uh, abscesses, especially if, the patients are, uh, if, especially if the patient is septic and sick. Um, ERCP, uh, the sensitivity and specificity is uh, 96 and 99%. So the first, uh, the first uh, important step in managing any patients with CBD stone is to manage cholangitis. And for cholangitis, uh, you either have a mild cholangitis, a moderate cholangitis, or severe cholangitis. 
and it's defined according to the uh, features. If there are no fe no signs, no symptoms, just uh, just moderate uh, uh, or, or just moderate pain, just like mild pain, uh, then the antibiotics and supportive care is just enough, and the patient then can be um, can be. Uh, followed up or we can do an elective ERCP and uh, cholecystectomy. Uh, if the uh, presentation is moderate, uh, and moderate is defined if two of the following present, if the WBC more than 12,000 uh, or less than uh, 4,000, if there is a fever more than 39, the age of the patient is more than 75, the bilirubin is more than five, or there is a hypoalbuminemia, then the patient will need antibiotic. We should attempt doing a drainage procedure. So we should uh, we should go ahead with ERCP. Uh, if ERCP fails, then PTC. If PTC fails, then we should uh, attempt surgery. And if the patient is presenting with severe dysfunction of the organs, which is defined by cardiac hypotension requiring vasopressors, altered mental status, the uh, respiratory uh, depression, there will be a uh, renal decrease, renal and urine output, uh, the INR would be more than 1.5 and the platelets will be low, then the patient will need more ICU intensive care unit. And we should at that time go for urgent ERCP or PTC, and if both uh, elements fail, then we should consider an uh, open uh, CBD or laparoscopic CBD exploration. So when it comes to um, cholelithiasis, how we can um, define basically whether the patient is having a likelihood CBD stones. So um, likelihood CBD stones is based on different clinical and risk factors can be, we can say that there is a low likelihood that this patient will have a CBD stones or intermediate likelihood or a high likelihood that this patient will have stones. And this is uh, uh, identified by the risk factors for cholelithiasis. And what are those risk factors? There is a common bile duct stone on abdominal ultrasound, or there is a dilated common bile duct or there is a clinical evidence of acute cholangitis, or there, the total bilirubin is more than 1.7 uh, uh, milligram per deciliter. So the presence of more than two factors suggest, uh, uh, suggest that the uh, person uh, uh, will have a high probability that he's having CBD stone. But if he doesn't have any of these factors, then it's a low probability. So if the patient is having a low probability of CBD stones, then the patient can go ahead with laparoscopic cholecystectomy. If, we are, if the patient doesn't have two risk factors, but he does have one of these risk factors, then uh, we can go for either intra-op cholangiogram, we can go ahead with uh, cholecystectomy and intra-op cholangiogram, or we can order an MRCP or EUS uh, uh, prior to cholecystectomy. And it's quite equivalent to go ahead with both of them, basically. So, um, and this basically depends on the uh, surgeon's uh, expertise and uh, whether they are familiar with the MIS procedures and they are happy with it. So, if the intraop cholangiogram was negative, then the person can go ahead and uh, perform cholecystectomy. Otherwise, if it's positive, then we can do a laparoscopic or open common bile duct exploration with cholecystectomy, or we we, um, we close the patient, we just do a cholecystectomy and then proceed with ERCP after the procedure. Sorry. And if the patient had an MRCP or EUS prior to the surgery, if it was negative, then we can clearly go ahead with cholecystectomy. And if it was positive, we can go ahead uh, with either ERCP or we can go ahead with laparoscopic or common bile duct exploration along with cholecystectomy. And again, this always depends on the availability and facility of, uh, of uh, ERCP and endoscopic people and the um, experience of the uh, surgeon. If the person does have a high probability, he does have two of these risk factors, 
then he, we say that he does have a high probability of having stone, then he can go directly ahead with ERCP or go with laparoscopic uh, CBD exploration and cholecystectomy. I would always prefer to go ahead with ERCP just, just for the fact to um, avoid, like if there is uh, incomplete clearance of the, of, the, of the CBD due to multiple stones or a stone which is very large and stuck to the distal part of the, uh, of the CBD, then the kind of we're exposing the patient after the surgery again to the uh, ERCP. So my preference always will, will be an endoscopy first, then we go ahead with the surgery. So for intraop cholangiogram, the indications for intraop cholangiograms, it varies according to uh, various basically uh, uh, reasons and various reasons we are doing this procedure for. So if the patient is presenting with jaundice or a previous history of jaundice, let's say that the person came to you and say, last week I had jaundice, but you check the bilirubin, it's normal. Uh, so such people you can system and perform an intraop for them just to make sure that there are no uh, uh, slipped stones into the CBD. And if the of pancreatitis particularly related to gallstone pancreatitis, then you can do an intraop plenum. If there's an elevated liver function test, let's say that the patient's presenting to us, he does have an ALT, um, mild elevation of ALT, ALP, uh, bilirubin is normal. You don't know what's happening with the patient. The CBD is normal and, um, and, and the person doesn't have any history of alcohol or fibrosis or any history of hepatitis, then you can, you can do an intraop angiogram just to make sure that there are no slip stones there. A common bile duct larger than five to seven millimeter in diameter a cystic duct larger than three millimeter in diameter during the surgery while you are doing the surgery. If you saw that the uh, cystic duct is, is larger than millimeter, then you can do an intraop phalangiogram just to make sure that there are no uh, stones uh, uh, in the CBD. Uh, if there are multiple small, small gallbladder uh, uh, stones, especially those uh, um, small cholesterol and small uh, bilirubinate stones, then uh, those stones they have a chance to, um, to be present in the CBD, so you can do an intraop If there is an unclear anatomy during the uh, uh, surgery, then you can do an intraop cholangiogram. Uh, if there is common bile duct stones, visualize on pre-op uh, ultrasound, uh, as we said, according to the algorithm. If there is a possible bile duct leak or injury during the, uh, uh, during the surgery or short cystic duct, then you can do an intraop cholangiogram just to make sure that you didn't injure the CBD. So intraop cholangiogram, it may decrease the risk of bile duct injury, but its routine use, it remains controversial. There are a lot of studies uh, about it, but it's still controversial. And uh, basically, you should always uh, remember that there is a risk of doing an intraop cholangiogram as well. So if the patient was documented, so now we do have a patient who's documented with cholecystitis. If we knew that preoperatively, then as I said, we can either go to ERCP or laparoscopic CVD exploration. If we found that intraop, then we can proceed with laparoscopic CVD exploration or just uh, proceed with cholecystectomy and then, uh, and then proceed with ERCP after the surgery. And that's not uh, uh, wrong. You can always do cholecystectomy if you are not comfortable and then uh, uh, let the endoscopists deal with the uh, CBD stones. Post-operative, um, if you find, uh, um, can be at attempted, and if it is unsuccessful, then uh, try attempting with percutaneous biliary drainage. Uh, otherwise, you can go ahead with uh, laparoscopic uh, CBD uh, exploration again, uh, if uh, the other measure fails the percutaneous biliary drainage. So, um, so managing CBD stones is quite challenging because um, um, 
because there are different presentations and the patient might have different anatomy um, as I, and there are different algorithms. And those algorithms that I showed you, it's, it's, there are SAGE's algorithms uh, that are important and they were updated in 2019. Uh, but again, it's always important and you should know that the ultimate goal of therapy is always to extract the stone and eliminate the offending agent. So never forget the uh, gallbladder if still present. And the, in terms of diagnostic and therapeutic approaches, they can be complex. And the complexity is due to several factors. It depends always on the expertise of the surgeon, the accessibility of the uh, other adjunctive services like the GATC, and it depends on the support and the resources of the institution as well, and the patient's clinical presentation. If the patient's presenting with cholangitis or no cholangitis, whether the gallbladder is there, not there, whether the patient does have an altered upper GI anatomy, he did have bypass before, gastrectomy, Whipple surgery, anything before. So um, if decompression, you should remember the general rule, if decompression is urgent because the patient is septic and does have cholangitis, then you should always, without any discussion, go for ERCP. If that person, the ERCP is not accessible somehow because of the anatomy or because of any other reason, then always attempt for a percutaneous biliary drainage. If the percutaneous biliary drainage is not accessible because of like non-dilated biliary system or any other reason, then you should go ahead with CBD exploration, whether open or MIS, because the decompression is really important in that patient because he's septic. But if the decompression is not urgent, then it depends what are we dealing with. So in this case, this person does have CBD stones that, um, that are not bothering him, not causing uh, cholangitis, for example. So um, if the patient does not have any altered GI anatomy or cholecystectomy, then we can do a two-stage approach. We can do a laparoscopic cholecystectomy followed by ERCP or ERCP followed by laparoscopic cholecystectomy. It depends on the uh, availability of the, um, uh, of the surgeon and the availability of the endoscopist. Uh, or we can go for a one-stage approach. We can do an MIS single-stage approach with, which can mention whether it's a transcystic or transpolydocal approach, and we'll talk more about it, or whether it's a laparoscopic uh, rendezvous technique I'll talk about it later on as well. Or, it, uh, or we do an MIS cholidoco introstomy, whether it's a cholidoco duodenostomy or cholidoco duodenostomy. If the person does have an altered GI anatomy, and I'll show you a picture later on to understand what do I mean by altered anatomy, then uh, the laparoscopic assisted transgastric ERCP or an open CBD exploration would be the choice uh, in such people or laparoscopic CBD exploration. In patients who cannot tolerate uh, a major operation, uh, then the biliary tree can be accessed by uh, percutaneous trans uh, uh, hepatic phalangogram catheters uh, to rendezvous with ERCP. So we insert a guide wire into the uh, uh, into the um, into the um, the biliary system, and eventually we uh, internalize the uh, drain into the duodenum, and that would help the endoscopist later on to do an ERCP and cannulate the bile duct uh, easily and directly because this stent would help them to locate the uh, uh, the uh, the biliary tree. So this is uh, kind of a summary to whatever I said right now. So when it comes to surgical management of CBD stones, it's either laparoscopic or robotic or an open technique, or it's either an ERCP, or it's either, uh, this is if there is an un unaltered GI anatomy, or if there is an altered GI anatomy, like, like in case of Billroth II reconstruction or the uh, Ruan Y gastric bypass, then the option is either we do a laparoscopic or a, a robotic CBD exploration, or we do a laparoscopic or robotic assisted transgastric ERCP, or we can, we can do an open technique, we can do an open CBD exploration or an open uh, trans uh, duodenal uh, uh, sphincteroplasty 
or an open assisted transgastric uh, uh, approach uh, uh, with ERCP. And I'm going to show you pictures and everything. I know now you are confused with all these uh, uh, terms and all these uh, surgical uh, um, maneuvers. So for laparoscopic CBD exploration, we always start with flushing. So once you go, once you cannulate the uh, uh, CBD, you start with flushing with normal saline and see uh, the stone. The stone sometimes, especially if, if, if there are um, uh, cholesterol, um, especially, sorry, if there are bilirubinate stones or if they are, um, uh, or if there is sludge there, then it's kind of, it would be very easy to just um, bring it out with a normal saline flush. Um, if you want to relax the sphincter of UD, we can use one to two uh, milligram of, uh, uh, of glucagon. Uh, it can be administered IV and then uh, the, uh, the sphincter can relax a bit and, and the, uh, we can flush the biliary system and the stones can go into the duodenum and then we can do a cholangiogram and confirm the clearance of the, uh, of the CBD. If, the, if this is unsuccessful, then we can use uh, a balloon catheter. Uh, or uh, um, we can use a dormia basket uh, to retrieve the uh, stones. If these maneuvers are unsuccessful, then we can use a polydocoscope. There is a certain polydocoscope that can go and cannulate the, uh, that can go into the, uh, 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 into the uh, CBD and uh, it can help you the, through the polydocoscope, you can do the dormia basketing, you can do the, uh, the balloon, and you can flush as well, and uh, it will help to clear the uh, CBD. And if you use the, uh, the polydocoscope, then there is no need for a phalangiogram at the end because you kind of confirm by visualizing the uh, CBD directly. So... Um, for uh, to do a, a CBD exploration, you can either uh, uh, go through uh, uh, the uh, cystic duct or through the CBD itself. So we call it a transcystic approach or a transpolydocal approach. We can go through transcystic approach if there is a non tortuous cystic duct um, or the uh, uh, or there is a small CBD stones less than 10 millimeter and the cystic duct diameter is more than four millimeter and the stones are distal to the cystic duct uh, CBD junction and the CBD is less than six millimeter or there are less than eight retained CBD stones. So in general, I would say if the CBD is kind of dilated, if there are very large stones, very huge number of stones, and the uh, uh, then you better go through the, uh, uh, the the CBD. But if the stones are very small, the cystic duct is dilated, and the um, and the uh, stones kind of crushable, uh, then it's better to go through the transcystic approach. And everyone prefers in the beginning to do a transcystic approach, so you don't have to make an opening uh, within the CBD and then uh, can cause, uh, which can cause basically a future stricture. So this is a picture which can show you through a transcystic approach. Um, you can basically uh, clip the uh, uh, cystic duct proximally, then do a small opening uh, uh, in the cystic duct. And then through that opening, you can uh, cannulate the cystic duct, do the intraop phalangiogram in the beginning to confirm the stone presence. And then once you see the stones, then you can introduce the, uh, balloon, uh, uh, the balloon catheter, or you can do a dormia basket to retrieve the stones outside, or if this failed, you can uh, use a polydocoscope and, uh, uh, and guide yourself through the polydocoscope and you can use the, the dormia basket through the polydocoscope and clear the CBD. And basically the advantage of one stage approach, approach compared to two stage approach, it's a shorter hospital stay and lower cost basically, but there is nothing else about it. When it comes to a uh, transcolidocal uh, approach, so you make an opening within the CBD, which is uh, almost two centimeter, and uh, then you cannulate uh, uh, the CBD and you do a cholangiogram, confirm again the presence of the stones, and then you go ahead with the other uh, maneuvers uh, as we described before, whether with the uh, basket or the balloon or the polydocoscope itself. 
Through the lapro endoscopic rendezvous technique, this is um, a technique where um, the endoscopists in such a case would be cooperative and they are available. So they can come and help you uh, during the OR. You can uh, cannulate the, uh, the, uh, the uh, CBD through the transcystic approach. And then once the guide wire is there in the budenum, they can go ahead with the scope. They can uh, detect the guide wire and then it will be very easy for them to, uh, uh, to uh, cannulate the biliary tree and uh, do an ERCP. So that's why we call it a laparoendoscopic rendezvous. So it's a rendezvous kind of retrograde technique. When it comes to uh, cholidocogedonostomy, we use uh, more uh, 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 frequently cholidocogedonostomy in those patients who are very friable and they do have a lot of uh, distal CBD stones that cannot be retrieved through the laparoscopic or an open approach. And uh, then the, uh, the, the, the alternative is we go ahead with uh, a cholidocogedonostomy. We make an incision like a T-shape. So you see here a T-shape. So it's a two centimeter incision on the CBD and then another like a two, two and a half centimeter uh, uh, incision longitudinal on the uh, duodenal. And then you can see kind of a diamond shape we do with the anastomosis here. Then this is what we call it a polydoco duodenostomy. So the bile would be kind of uh, diverted and the stone can uh, remain there and we can always reattend doing uh, an ERCP later on once the patient is, uh, uh, is drained well. Ruan Y hepatic genostomy, we can do it uh, as well uh, when the person does have a friable uh, CBD with a lot of stones and there are a lot of strictures or there are a lot of stones which cannot be cleared uh, distally uh, in the CBD. Then if the people are not familiar and are not happy to deal with the duodenum, then they can do a Ruan Y hepaticogegenostomy. So we bring the RULIMB and we do a hepaticogegenostomy. Some of the people and some of the surgeons advocate the, uh, um, uh, the connection between the, uh, uh, the, uh, between the uh, RULIMB and the abdominal wall, which we call it a Heston loop, just for future cannulation of the, uh, of the biliary tree in case there is a stricture or uh, there is a need for dilatation or there are stones as well. So um, this is the way we do a, a, a Heston loop. We just use like a 3 silk just to connect the loop into the abdominal wall. And we use the uh, afferent uh, uh, limb uh, in this way, uh, sorry, the uh, rule limb in this way, or we kind of use the, uh, the blinded pouch in this way. The other way which is advocated by the, uh, uh, by the surgeons is to do a, a gastro a, a, a gastrojejunostomy as well uh, at the blind end here, just for easier cannulation of the uh, uh, of the biliary tree later on. But this kind kind of kind of carries a risk as well of uh, reflex cholangitis. So CBD closure. So after exploration, we need to close the CBD, and there are ways to close the CBD. It's either a primary closure or a closure through a T-tube. And, for primary closure, for primary closure, we need to make sure that there is a patent ampulla of batter, there is a complete removal of these stones, so there is no increased biliary pressure and obstruction as well, then the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, stitches can open, and there is an absence of any pancreatic uh, uh, pathology, and there is a, a meticulous sutures of the duct, so the duct is not uh, cholangitic and not friable then otherwise I would prefer to do a T-tube rather than close primarily. And sometimes when we leave, we uh, put um, a stent uh, and some people prefer to uh, uh, put a stent and um, it's not wrong to put a stent, uh, but it's not proven that it will uh, basically prevent uh, any leak or opening of your closure. Um, for T-tube closure, um, uh, to be a safe surgeon in your exams, R5, 
uh, whenever a person asks you how to close the CBD after exploration, you always say, I would close it with a T-tube just to be a safe surgeon. Although this is an old answer, uh, but uh, always mention a T-tube closure because they like it. Um, but otherwise, the preferred closure nowadays, uh, it's a primary closure because it showed it won't increase the risk of any uh, uh, future strictures. So for, um, for T-tube, uh, again, we will just put a, a T-tube uh, through the uh, opening and we'll close the uh, CBD around it. And then uh, for uh, T-tube management, this T-tube, um, I would prefer it uh, in cases where there is incomplete clearance of the CBD and still there are a lot of sludge uh, or there is a structure there that I'm not sure about it or I don't have the facility of polydocoscope or other options to do uh, or I'm not sure about the readings of my uh, cholangiogram then I would prefer to put a, a, a T-tube and then uh, do a cholangiogram after 14 days just to make sure that the, 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 the whole duct is cleared or not. For open CBD exploration, uh, basically the open technique is reserved as the last resort when the other options have failed. And generally uh, it is used for large stones or when there is a limited surgical experience with MIS technique. And for the open approach, um, we can either go for a transjudinal uh, sphincter plasty, especially if the stones are more in the distal CBD, or we can go for a, a colidoco uh, uh, introstomy, whether a colidoco jejunostomy or a colidoco jejunostomy. And this technique, and this technique will only use it if there is incomplete clearance of the uh, uh, CBD, or the CBD was too uh, uh, friable, and you need to do something about it. And these are the techniques uh, while doing an open exploration. It's kind of different than the laparoscopic because. Here you can uh, feel the, uh, the, uh, the uh, CBD and you can always milk the stones uh, 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 distally from the ampulla of batter into the opening that you made. So, uh, and, and to help you do this technique, you should do a bit of cockerization uh, because that will help you to hold the uh, judenum nicely posteriorly along with the pancreas. And then you can milk it and uh, retrieve the stone through the opening. Or again, you can use, sorry, my computer is super sensitive. Or you can use uh, the uh, other techniques like flushing, like again, the dormia basket, you can use like the uh, crushing uh, forcep just to crush the stones there and then uh, retrieve them. And this technique, the open technique always helps you just to clear the uh, proximal CBD as well. But as well, even the laparoscopic technique can uh, clear the CBD uh, uh, proximally, especially if we use the polydocoscope. We can use lithotripsy as well. There are four types of uh, different uh, uh, techniques of lithotripsy, but these lithotripsies are just reserved for those patients with uh, large stones and they are friable patients who cannot tolerate surgeries and we are limited with endoscopy only. So, so those patients, I would kind of prefer to do lithotripsy for them. So what about the patients whom we cannot uh, approach them through the, through the stomach and the transgastric approach because of an altered anatomy? And the altered anatomy, it's what you see here. So if the, if the patient had a gastric bypass, then the, uh, the gastric pouch, it would be completely isolated and you cannot go through endoscopy. Some people, they do attempt to do uh, um, a balloon push uh, uh, in tiroscope, but in Ruan Y, it's kind of very long limb then, and it's, it's kind of challenging. So the endoscopist don't prefer to do it. But again, they, they kind of might re attempt to do that. Uh, and that's why in such big surgeries, we always do a tattoo in, 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 in this area just to mark it uh, for the endoscopist for future access into the biliary system. And as well as Whipple, when we do Whipple procedures, sometimes we do mark the afferent limb just to make it easier for the uh, endoscopist to access the biliary system if there is any stricture or stone formation or anything. So um, wrapping 
rapid weight loss uh, following gastric bypass is associated with up to 35 uh, uh, percent of gallstone formation. And ERCP is considered a challenge in such cases, as I told you. And the options in such case is to do a laparoscopic or open uh, cholecystectomy and CBD exploration, plus minus uh, cholidopa uh, uh, enteric anastomosis if it is needed, basically, and if, if there is no complete clearance of the, uh, uh, of the CBD. Um, we can go ahead with laparoscopic cholecystectomy, uh, cholidocoscopy can use, we can do a cholidocodidonostomy, as I mentioned. We can do an open sphincterotomy. So if there is a distal CBD uh, stones, we can do always a transduodenal uh, 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 sphincter, uh, sphincter, uh, sphincterotomy, and uh, we can access the, uh, the stones and retrieve them. And we can do a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, uh, what we call it a laparoscopic uh, assisted transgastric ERCP and EUS. So we go laparoscopic, we make an opening, a gastrostomy, and then the endoscopist can uh, access the uh, duodenum through the endoscopy and do the ERCP and retrieve the stones. So those are the main things in CBD stones. Please do ask me as many questions as you want if you didn't understand anything and we can go through it again. Uh, but I know that CBD stones uh, are challenging to manage, but uh, always remember that if decompression is needed in such patients and they are presenting with sepsis, then go with endoscopy first and then go ahead with surgery. And surgery will always be type of the surgery that you would do in such patients, it would depend on the uh, risk factors and, 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 and whether you are doing a complete clearance or not of the CBD. How to manage hepatolithiasis? So hepatolithiasis, they occur in less than 1% of Western patients who tend to be older than uh, uh, in, in their 50th or 60th years of age. Uh, they are Caucasian and have some underlying biliary pathology, like strictures, for example. And endemic, and in endemic, uh, uh, um, it's it's pretty endemic in Asian Pacific region with a prevalence rate of 30 to 50 percent. And as I said, it's a disease of fifth and sixth decade of life with no gender preference. It's equal males and females. Uh, 70 percent of the patients with intrahepatic stones they have a bilateral disease. So you can see how challenging it is. And the intrahepatic stones are usually brown pigment stones. With regards to pathogenesis, the main pathogenesis behind uh, hepatolithiasis, it's sclerosing cholangitis and biliary cystic disease, especially Carolis uh, disease, um, uh, which is, type, which is uh, considered as type four uh, biliary cystic disease where the disease is confined into the liver. Uh, the other uh, risk factors which can lead, it's a diminished bile uh, uh, flow due to strictures. And these strictures, uh, they are either due to malignancy or fibrosis because of previous instrumentations or previous, uh, uh, or previous uh, stones in the CBD. Um, parasitic infections, including clonorchis uh, uh, or uh, obsurpis. Diet, which are low in protein and high in starch, uh, it can predispose to the uh, formation of hepatolithiasis. Sorry. So in terms of presentation, again, the presentation, it would be the same presentation as the CBD stone. It would be the pain which basically would be according to the uh, location of the uh, stones, although it won't matter a lot. But if these stones are causing a lot of pyogenic abscesses and stretching the capsule, whether it's in the left side, right side, then the pain would be uh, uh, in different location. Uh, the, per the person might present with cholangitis, so he might have fever, chills, uh, jaundice, depending on how much uh, uh, of that duct is affected and whether there is a lower atrophy or not, and pyogenic liver abscesses as well. And to make the diagnosis, again, the same modalities will use 
MRCP is quite helpful when we are dealing with anything intrahepatic um, because it will delineate the biliary tree, it will delineate if there is any strictures with it, if there is any suspicion that this patient does have a cystic disease or a sclerosing cholangitis, if there is enhancement which is suspicious of cholangiocarcinoma, and, uh, and even if there is um, uh, uh, if there is um, multi-lobar disease, then it's better to do an MRCP. CT liver, it will uh, kind of help you if there is a clear mass there, clear ductal dilatation and abscesses. And we always want to rule out whether this person is just, we can use it. It's, it's, it's quite sometimes helpful just if there is a uh, um, dilatation there, Sometimes it might detect the stones and the liver abscesses as well. And ERCP, it's quite uh, challenging in such a case, especially if the uh, stones are uh, intrahepatic. But if the stones are kind of uh, uh, extrahepatic within the common hepatic duct or the left or right hepatic duct, then ERCP is kind of useful and at the same time can retrieve those uh, stones out. And the main aim of diagnosis is, first of all, to accurately localize where are these stones and to determine whether there are any biliary strictures there or not. Because if there are biliary strictures, then we need to uh, do brushings because 80% of these strictures are malignant. So we need to be careful about that. Identifying any involved loops of the liver. So uh, because it's important and it will determine what sort of uh, uh, operation you are going to do for this patient and to exclude uh, any concomitant cholangiocarcinoma. So it's very important in such patients who present with multiple uh, uh, intrahepatic biliary stones, there are strictures or you're not sure whether there are strictures or not, then it's better to, uh, uh, to do um, uh, an MRCP and, uh, and do an ERCP, do your brushings and check your tumor markers as well to just make sure that this person doesn't have a cholangiocarcinoma. I know CA99 eventually would be high because there is an obstruction in the biliary system, but if it was super high, something like 1,000, then that is a clear indication that there is something wrong and uh, there might be a malignancy there. So when it comes to uh, CBD uh, uh, stones, you can see here in the picture that there is atrophy of the uh, left lateral segment of the uh, liver, which indicates that there is a massive uh, a disease and process which were happening for quite a long time over this, uh, uh, over this uh, uh, segment. And you can see other stones here with, uh, uh, with dilated biliary system as well and other dilated ducts here and there, which indicates that this person is having a bilateral disease. Whereas here you can see that most likely the disease is confined to one area. So the aims of the management, whenever you're having a person with uh, hepatolithiasis, the first thing is to resolve an ongoing infection. So antibiotic, fluid, make sure you send your cultures and make sure that the patient is on broad spectrum antibiotic until you get the uh, bile wash, then uh, uh, that should be all covered. And then prevent recurrent uh, cholangitis and liver fibrosis. That is one of the main management that you, you need to keep in your mind. Prevent recurrent instrumentation. So you should always look for the definite management rather than, you know, like keep doing uh, ERCP and endoscopy for years and prevent progression to cholangiocarcinoma because as I told you before, anything which predisposed to chronic inflammation of the biliary system, it's a precursor for cholangiocarcinoma. So we should be careful about that. So endoscopic management, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a treatment of choice in such cases when it's not challenging and when it's not advanced and not involving bilateral loops and there is no liver fibrosis, uh, uh, but it's quite basically challenging in such cases. So if the biliary drainage uh, um, was not happening with the, uh, with the, with the ERCP, then always such patients, they will need a PTC and they will need a PTBD, which we call it uh, percutaneous transhepatic biliary uh, uh, drainage tubes. And, uh, and sometimes these patients will stay like for a longer time on these uh, tubes. And we need to make sure that these tubes are going internal uh, into the duodenum 
because it will drain the bile directly into the duodenum. So um, there is no a Western classification of, uh, of, of hepatolithiasis because of the rarity of the disease in Western countries. But in Japan, there is this classification, which is called Dong's classification of hepatolithiasis. Uh, for, um, and it's used, it's used to determine what are the surgical approaches that you will consider in such cases. And I find it very useful. Uh, in type A, there will be a localized stone disease. It will be a unilober or bilober, but it's localized in one area only. In type 2, there is type 2A, B, or C. There will be a diffuse stone disease with no atrophy or any hepatic parenchyma uh, uh, disease or strictures, or type 2B, where there is a segmental atrophy or and stricture of the uh, intrahepatic bile ducts, or there is a type 2C in which there is a biliary cirrhosis already and there's a portal hypertension, or the person is manifesting liver failure and portal hypertension. So in each different uh, uh, scenario, there'll be a different management basically. Percutaneous management, as I told you before, it should be uh, limited to the people who are having less burden of the disease and less amount of stones and they do have um, the, their biliary systems kind of dil dilated. So it will help the PTC tube to, um, uh, to uh, proceed uh, directly into the uh, biliary, into the CBD. And we should make sure that there is uh, no fibrosis and there is no malignancy as well. And it is uh, recommended if there is a proximal uh, uh, stricture uh, and it might require multiple attempts to upsize. So we might start with the smaller one and then we need to uh, upsize it after, uh, after two weeks uh, to a month. And then we kind of do multiple sessions and dilatations, whether we do a balloon dilatation and clear the stones every time. In terms of surgical management, we should remember that the safety of hepatectomy nowadays has improved significantly in the recent decade due to the improvement in, in anesthesia care. And it's important to exclude hepatic malignancy and sepsis due to liver manipulation during uh, uh, surgery. So you should be careful while dealing with such cases. Patients where hepatolithiasis is limited to one loop or sector, the hepatectomy is always the procedure of choice. And in patients with bilateral disease without fibrosis, hepaticogenostomy with intraoperative cholangioscope is the procedure of choice. So we do a drainage procedure just to help the patient to uh, drain the, uh, uh, the bile. And we do an intraop cholangioscope and just drain all those uh, uh, bile ducts. And sometimes we might combine this. We might do a hepaticogenostomy plus um, some minor hepatectomy as well might need percutaneous management pre or post uh, surgical procedure for residual stones. And sometimes, uh, um, uh, and, and sometimes it will kind of uh, guide us and help us to know the anatomy as well. And these people, they will need a lot of care and they are kind of chronic and sometimes they require an extensive care and sometimes they might require an extensive uh, hepatectomy basically. So uh, surgical management as a uh, uh, perseverity classification according to Dong's. So, so uh, in Dong's paper, he described that for type A localized tone disease, whether it's unilober or bilober, but it's localized, then the hepatectomy would be the best option for those patients. And in those patients where there is no atrophy, or no stricture within the bile ducts, then stone removal, as we said, and hepatocogenostomy as a drainage procedure would be the best uh, procedure of choice. And if there is a segmental atrophy and or stricture uh, of the intrahepatic bile ducts, then again, hepatectomy would be the answer, especially if it is confined to one area. And if the person does have biliary cirrhosis and portal hypertension, so please, please, don't touch those patients 
do percutaneous drainage as much as possible if they are symptomatic and the person might require a liver transplant. And he added uh, type E uh, dongs in his classification where he involved the sphincter of UDI, whether it's a relaxed uh, sphincter or whether there's stricture at the sphincter as well. And he recommended doing a hepatic regionostomy in case both uh, cases present because they will predispose to the increase in the pressure in the biliary system. So this is regarding uh, CBD stones and hepatolithiasis. I hope that you did understand the topic. I know some of the terms are quite new for you guys, but you can go through the presentation again and it will make a lot of sense to you. And uh, hopefully you did understand. And at the end, I would just say that biliary stones uh, management is quite challenging and it will always need a full team workup, including surgeons, interventional radiologists, and endoscopic specialists. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Noreen, for a very wonderful and uh, rich session. Uh, I believe you have some questions. Uh, we're going to post them up now. Sure. Uh, before, okay, so we'll go through the questions. Before the questions, uh, Dr. Noreen, would you like to uh, play the video or should we leave that to after the question? Oh, yeah. I do have a small video about the intra-op uh, cholangiograms. You can watch it, guys. Do you see it? Uh, just a second. Let me do my new share. Uh, so Dr. Noreen, if you can just stop sharing your screen and then reshare yeah. the one with the video, I think that'll make it work. Do you see it or not? Okay. Yeah, great. Um,
that table, everything is labeled. That's it, that's the video. Okay, thank you, Dr. Noreen, for sharing your video. Uh, before we go on to the questions, I just want to remind everyone that if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section. Uh, we'll start with our MCQs now. So the first question is a 54 years old, otherwise healthy woman presents to the emergency department with abdominal pain, fever, chills, confusion, the blood pressure is 95 over 50, the heart rate is 110, the temperature is 39, and the labs showed WBC of 15, and the hematocrit and platelets are normal. The direct bilirubin was uh, 7.2, the initial management should be. Emergency biliary decompression endoscopically or transhepatically, emergent cholecystectomy, IV fluid resuscitation and antibiotic, observation and pain control, discharge home with oral antibiotic with planned cholecystectomy in the coming weeks. This should be a very easy question. So I'll give about one minute for everyone to answer the question. Okay, just a few more seconds. So, okay, I think that's good. Um, let's share the answer. Okay, yeah, excellent. <laughs> Excellent. At least 40% of you guys answered the, right. the good answer. So the answer is IV fluid resuscitation and antibiotic. Always remember, guys, cholangitis, cholangitis, cholangitis. The first management would be cholangitis, and then you go ahead with uh, decompression. We'll go to the next question. So you have a 67-year-old male who presents complaining of itching, dark urine, and epigastric pain, and the examination reveals jaundice. The total bilirubin was 6.5 milligram per deciliter. The alkaline phosphatase was uh, three times more than the upper limit, and mild elevation of serum transaminases. 
what would be your uh, first initial attempt to do an abdominal ultrasound, CT scan, and uh, uh, MRI of the abdomen, or ERCP? Okay, so we'll give about 30 seconds for this question. Is it shorter than the first one? Okay, so everybody put your final answers in. Okay. Excellent, guys. So yes, so always ultrasound would be the, the first choice in any person who's presenting with an obstructive picture. Next question. And this would be the last question. It's a 45 years old lady who presents to the HPV clinic with a three centimeter stone in the neck of the gallbladder and it's eroding into the CBD affecting about 50% of its diameter. Which uh, she has been uh, counseled about surgery and she's willing. What would be the most appropriate surgery for this patient? Is it cholecystectomy, removal of the stone, and primary repair of the CBD over a T-tube? Is it radical cholecystectomy? Is it cholecystectomy and the use of a flap of the gallbladder to repair the defect in the CBD? Is it a cholecystectomy and go and why hepatic ostomy? Okay, so we'll give about one minute for this question too. We've got four options. Okay, let's go ahead and put our final answers in. Let's see the answer. Shuf al-ajayib with me. No. <laughs> no, guys. So the right answer is to do a cholecystectomy and do an y hepatic ostomy. I know this is whatever we are describing here in the in the in the question. It's a Meresis syndrome. I know I didn't talk about it because it was covered previously, but remember always Meresis syndrome. It's always there is a fistula or there is basically um, so it's a fistula with the from the Hartman pouch or the cystic duct into the CBD uh, into the common hepatic duct, sorry. And if this fistulation is anything above 25%, then we should uh, uh, do a repair of the bile duct because 50% of the bile duct would be friable, disease, and you cannot just repair 50% of the duct. So you better go always go with hepatic ostomy. So the answer is a cholecystectomy and go and why hepatic ostomy in this question. Thank you, okay, guys. So These are... um, well, we don't have any questions yet in the Q&A, so if anyone has any questions they'd like to uh, ask, please put them in now. Um, okay, in the meantime, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Noreen. That was a really uh, nice session. Um, and you well, both. hopefully you did understand, guys. I try to put as many pictures as I can because I know sometimes if I display the videos of the surgeries, you want to pick it up and you want to understand. And I guess if you keep it as a resource for you, then these pictures would be the best to understand. Oh, thank you. Any I don't questions? think you have any questions. Uh, so this I is either they didn't me. understand anything or <laughs> they didn't understand everything. <laughs> it was a very well-rounded session. So you covered a lot of the topics actually. Thank you very oh, much okay, for that. Guys. Um, and um, 
it was really nice to wrap up the surgical series with your session. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here with us and we look forward to having you again in future sessions, inshallah, and future series in the future. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Noreen. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And good luck in your exam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us and uh, attending the session and attending all of our uh, surgical fix sessions. Um, we look forward to having you again. And before we go, I would just like to remind you about our uh, plastic surgery foundation course. We have our fifth session tomorrow, and it's going to be about craniomaxillofacial surgery by Dr. John Steen from Western University. So uh, you can scan the barcode if you'd like to join. You can also uh, scan the barcodes to check out our website, Instagram page, or our Twitter page and our podcast. Um, thank you again for joining, and we look forward to having you in more sessions.